Hello friends, thank you so much for choosing to watch another episode of my little um, YouTube companion show, Soundtrack and Extra. It's lovely to have you with us. Um, first of all, I personally really like to say thank you to everybody who sent um, congratulations messages. It was announced this week that um, along with Dermot O'Leary and Clara Amphom, I'm going to be hosting this year's BAFTA Awards. So excited! So excited. Um, but let's get down to business. We've got another great episode. Three fantastic guests coming up for you. Morvid Clark on the way talking about her just mind-blowing performance in St. Maud. Um, we've also got Steve McQueen talking about his extraordinary collection of films, the Small Acts series. But first up, Mr. Jamie Dornan. Um, I love Jamie. I think he is a, he's a brilliant laugh. He's just really good company. I've been lucky enough to interview him quite a few times and spend a bit of time with him. And I just think he's he's good crack, as they would say in Ireland. And we know him for quite specific, specific roles. So the fall being one side of it, and then obviously Fifty Shades of Grey, which was this massive phenomenon, quite rightly so. But he's definitely experimenting with what his, his strengths are, I think. And comedy it seems to be something that he's a natural at I think he's got really good timing and you can tell that he's having fun with it I don't know if you've had the chance to check out Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar with Kristen Wiig and Annie Memorial it is bonkers and brilliant and stupid and just a really good tonic so if you haven't watched it yet then definitely definitely go and see it and well here's Jamie talking about it and I mean if this doesn't sell the film to you I'm not sure what will. Ooh George what's this drink with the skull and crossbones over it? Can we get one of those? It's called the buried treasure. Yo -ho. No one's ever finished the whole thing but if you get to the bottom it's a real treasure. You sure you guys want to do this? Yeah. Okay. I love treasure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Try to amend my carnivorous habits. Oh. 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 You finished that already? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Just for the record, we never find the treasure. You found a little chest at the bottom with the syrupy liquid. Oh yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. We licked that. We licked up all the syrup. Up. Let's go. Yeah. And you opened the scuba diver's mask and found the three pills. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I took a pill. I, I, I had one. Had a pill. Oh well, that's your treasure. I had so much fun with this film and those I mean she's a she Kristen's a bit of a genius I think in terms of her physical comedy that she can do and I love that she almost she almost like spreads that vibe around her entire cast it would seem um but talk to me a little bit about Edgar and what the appeal was for you about this film and this role well, to be honest, like it was just the two of them, you know, it was Kristen and Annie and, and their, their, their brilliance and their, and their genius. You know, my, one of my favorite things in the world, um, pieces of art, offerings, whatever you want to call it, is a SNL sketch that Kristen did. Uh, it's Liza Minnelli. Um, oh my God, it's amazing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and to me, that's like the funniest thing I've ever seen. Um, and obviously, that you know, beyond her sketch stuff and SNL days, she's just got this incredible body of work, and they're they're just so smart. And you know, I was kind of sold purely on the title. And like, even hearing you say it there, every time I hear Barb and Star go to Vista Del Mar, I laugh and I or I smile and I go. Jesus, like, what is that? Like, what, I, what is that craziness? Why aren't more films called something like that? <laughs> um, so, you know, I I hadn't been too quiet about wanting to do a comedy. You know, I, I'd, I'd sort of told enough people and certainly told my people and my stuff that, that I wanted to do it. And, um, uh, I'm with UTA in LA who represent all the big comedy people. Um, 
So I felt like it would happen eventually, but I didn't, and I really wanted it to, but I didn't think it would happen at that level straight away. You know, I didn't think I'd be doing it with the likes of Kristen and Annie straight away. And obviously, unbelievably powerful producing team behind it of comedy, titans of comedy themselves. So uh, it was just mad, you know, I would, I, I'd, but literally, I promise you off the title, I was like, uh, yeah, 100% I want to do this. <laughs> I want to talk to Josh Greenbaum, the director. If you guys hit it off, then, you know, we could probably make this happen. I was like, great, listen, let's, let's do it. I read the script, loved it, laughed the whole time. <laughs> and I jumped on a Zoom with, with, with Josh and Josh and I, it was that thing of, I felt like I'd known Josh my entire life and we just laughed and laughed and laughed. Like it was, you know, usually set aside an hour for those calls. You know, I think we were on for like over two hours laughing and talking nonsense until it was like midnight here because he was in LA and I was like, dude, I just actually have to go to sleep. I could talk to you all night. Yeah, it was, it was a really easy decision. Was the, was the song and dance number in the script? It was one line. <laughs> no. What was the but line? And, and he, when sings, Josh, like, he skips across the beach in song? <laughs> not even, not even, didn't even have that much um, uh, information. It said, I think it said, Edgar, Edgar, uh, Edgar performs an emotional song or an emotional dance. It might not even have said song. And actually, I don't think in any, even when I arrived in, Mexico to start shooting it. I don't think they planned for me to sing it. You know, they had, I think they thought it would just be like, they, they had They had it recorded by the time I got to Mexico and um, with a professional singer or whatever. And I think they just thought they'd keep that in. And then it was alluded to the fact that I could sing a wee bit and maybe I could do it and, get, you know, give it a go. So we did that. But no, I, 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 I think on my second Zoom, once I knew I was doing it, uh, this was before people knew what Zoom was actually more on my second uh, Skype or FaceTime with Josh. Um, he said something about, you know, when you, <laughs> when you come out to Mexico, um, you know, and we'll have two or three days of doing, uh, you know, dance rehearsals and stuff. And I was like, why? Was like, what, what am I done? Uh, and he, he's like, you know, and I, so I didn't, I didn't want to act like I didn't know what I was doing. So I was like, oh, yeah. great. Yeah, no cool. So I was going to come out early for that. And then, it honestly, wasn't until I got there and uh, I started doing this. I was sort of thrown into this sort of dance rehearsal. And I was like, hold on, what is this for? I don't even know. And they're like, you're a big, you're a big dance number. I was like, I don't even know what that is. And I had to like call like Josh and uh, arrange a meeting with Josh and, and Chris and Annie. Go, what, what are they talking about? I said, oh, no, now we see that as this big, you know, um, emotional like number. We're going to take two days to shoot it. And I've, you know, <laughs> amazing. Have you danced before? Like, have you had dance training? Because, like, seriously, those pirouettes are pretty impressive. But I'm gonna say that that uh, what I'll say is it's not all me. I'll say that. Uh, <laughs> Don't shatter the illusion. <laughs> listen, listen. It's, you know, there's, um, there's moments that it's me, but actually, there's moments where you're meant to definitely tell that it's not me um, for the comedy of it. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Just before I do the spin, like I'm spinning and I'm a wee bit off balance. And I'm spinning, but in my head, I was doing it perfectly. And then I saw it, I was like, oh, um, but I'm sort of spinning and then it clearly goes to this like guy who was, who's amazing. He didn't speak any English. And I just kept coming in and going, man, thank you so much. You look so cool. It's really great. <laughs> And he was like, well, oh, you know, it's, I think he must be like, thank you. Um, I can't dance seriously, so it kind of worked out well for me that the, I have to dance in this comedy. And yeah, <laughs> did you enjoy the singing side of it as well? Because I mean, you 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 used to sing. You were in a band and stuff as well. Do you know what I mean? It was it was part of your it was part of your world, and it has been as well. Like you know, sporadically throughout your career, you've 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 performed, you've sung in in films and stuff as well. But was that side of it nice? And I can sing a bit. I, I never wanted to be in a band. It was just one of those things that I kind of like happened and then we were pushed along a certain path and we're quite far down the path. And I was like, Jesus, I didn't really want, oh, Jesus, we we're on stage. <laughs> I didn't really want to do it, you know. <laughs> and, um, so, but, so, so I'm very reluctant. I'm a reluctant singer because I, I, I did it in a, in a forum that I was uncomfortable. So now when I just have to do it in the odd movie, I'm more, 
comfortable, I, I, I guess, you know. The, the, the thing with this was it's so hard to sing. Edgar's Prayer is such <laughs> a belter. It's a proper belter. What a show tune. And it is. It is. It's big. And, you know, the first time I recorded it in Mexico City, um, I was really nervous. I actually had a bit of a cold. I wasn't feeling great. And I was <laughs> like singing my heart out. Um, but struggling to hit the notes and kept having to like transpose it down and stuff to suit my to suit my range. And then anyway, I did it and uh, I did it a couple of times. I was getting more and more hoarse. And I was like, this is actually becoming a real struggle now. And then through the glass of the studio, Kristen and Annie arrived. And I said, like, oh, guys, please, I can't. Oh, man. Just can't, you know, and they were there for all the right reasons, you know, just to be supportive and show love and care. And, you know, they wrote the movie, they produced the movie. And, and uh, by this stage, they're good friends and they'd want to be there. And it's great. But it just piled on the pressure. And I think I sang pretty terribly. And then we, um, uh, Millie and I got sent uh, uh, an early screening of it of just the song sorry not the movie of just the song anyway i might dance and we watch it and it was all a lot of sensory overload as you can imagine having not seen it before <laughs> and then um, and then we finished it and i said to millie i was like my voice sounds good like i'm quite happy with my voice. And she was like, that wasn't you yeah. like, right okay <laughs> i just happened I guess I've become so accustomed to the the backing track of like the professional singer they had do the original track. And I was just not convinced that that was me. So then I then subsequently found out that I didn't really sing well enough in Mexico City to put it on. So then I re-recorded it um, at Real World Studios, Peter Gabriel yeah. Studios, just a, oh, wow. outside back box. So that's yeah. why I re-recorded it in, in fuller voice and I did not cold and, and that's what's in the movie. And like, you know, it, it, yeah, it's... It, <laughs> that's the problem we're having a, a a wife who's a brilliant composer and, and musician and that she's like instantly there she's like it's not you sorry it's just <laughs> me my brain instantly listen i i loved wild wild mountain time as well and but having you know emily there who you know talking about people who can sing there is somebody who has got some singing chops on her do you know what i mean um I mean, we, we were at the first glimpse of that, uh, you know, long before Emily and I were close or friends and, and before we'd worked together, um, we were at her, um, Felicity, her sister, married Stanley Tucci, they're very good friends of ours. We were at their wedding seven years ago and Emily sang like full on opera, like, like solo, like a cappella, like unbelievable, like, I think she sang like Ava Maria or something, I mean, something wow. insane. Um, and like pitch perfect um so she can really really sing and it's really effortless for her you know she she'll claim that she gets very nervous i'm, I'm not i'm sure she gets nervous but mm. the effect that like, gets very effortless and it does just sit within her very comfortably where i would have to really strain to get any kind of like, decency out of my voice i am um, i love i love that kind of sort of i don't want to spoil it for people because it's, it's not out here in the UK yet, but there's a really nice scene at the end of the film that involves a pair of you on stage, which um, no. people should look forward to for that one. Have you ever had a dream since you were a child and you couldn't let it go? So you put this gate between us. Has your dream made you happy or miserable? You kissed him! It was he that kissed me! That's what's got him worked up! I don't understand you people. Why do you make everything so hard? You just seem to accept these crazy things. I don't like a fight. Well, who does? Half of Ireland, just not me. If my true love, he were gone, I would surely find another. Anthony, time is running out. No Look out! What is love? Is it a quest? What are you doing? A madness. How many days do we have while the sun shines? It's not shining. I believe that it is. Will you call a seagull? Oh, the wonderful Jamie Dorn in there. Um, just finishing off there, talking about Wild Mountain Time, the um, John Patrick Shanley film that he is, is in, along with Emily Blunt, Christopher Walken, to name but a few, John Hamm. Um, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a really good kind of... Uh, kind of 
Irish comedy. I mean, being Scottish and seeing how Scottish stereotypes can be emphasised, like the colour almost like made brighter for certain films, um, I enjoy. And it's similar with this, I think, as well, with the whole Irish um, side to things. It's a really funny film. I've no idea when it's actually coming out here in the UK. It's already out in the States, but I'm hoping, I think it's coming out via Lionsgate at some point. So um, I'll keep you posted. But if you enjoyed the chat with Jamie, then you can go and listen to our full chat on the episode or his episode of the podcast Soundtracking. Um, next up then, and he was our guest last week on the podcast, the phenomenal Steve McQueen, who I've been lucky enough to have on the podcast twice. And he is, I, I, I think he's incredible. I get quite... Um, not intimidated by him, but I want to, I want to, um, I want him to have a nice time when he when he comes to be interviewed by me. I want I want to impress him. I think is what I'm what I'm trying to say. Um, and I sat and watched all the films in his small act series. There's five of them, kind of back to back over two days, and I think they're very, very, very important films. Um, and we were lucky enough to talk to him about music in them because the music has almost like a different role within each of the films. And in particular, the one that we're going to talk about right now, Lover's Rock, um, not only does music feature heavily in it, but there's one particular track that is very much the kind of the throbbing heartbeat of this film. Here's Steve to tell you more. I mean, it's a fairy tale, uh, Lover's Rock. Um, it was based on my aunt um, uh, leaving uh, my grandmother's house in Shivers Bush in, in the middle of the night. My grandmother wouldn't let her go to blues parties. So my uncle used to leave the back door open for her. And then she used to go and to Labra Grove party all night and then come back home, you know, in the early hours of the morning before church. And basically it was, and, and within that narrative, it was always based around um, that song, you know, it, it was always uh, based around silly games, um, and that was it. Um, so I had the head, I had the tail, I had the heart. So that was that was the, that was how we started it. And did you? Um, and how did the relationship with Dennis kind of, in terms of his involvement and his appearance in it, and you yeah. know, and and how did that well, start? Well, I was introduced, thank God, to Dennis through Paul Gilroy, an academic, you know, leading a British academic. Um, and um, we just hit it off. And uh, at first, I, you know, it was kind of funny because I was talking to um, um, Dennis about music and at the time and so forth and whatnot. He was making some music for me. And then Dennis sort of said, well, I want to be in it. I want to I want to be the bus driver. No, sorry, the bus conductor. And I said, oh, well, OK. <laughs> And I said, well, look, you know what? I've got other plans for you. And that's, and that's <laughs> what happened, so yeah. Um, Dennis, this, I, I actually had the pleasure of chatting to you a couple of years back about this song because I, I made a, I made a documentary for Sky Arts um, called "Songs to Have Sex To," and we, uh, and one of the one of the songs, it wasn't a, it wasn't a, a, um, a kind of chart thing. It was more about the kind of psychological, physical effect that music can have on you. And um, we came and talked to you at length about this song and. Uh, it's just amazing how this, it has this timeless quality to it as well. Even though it does transport you back to a time, you still hear it now and there's a connectivity to it. Can you remember going back to the creation of that song and what the intention was with the song, really? The intention was to create something that was infectious. <laughs> you know, um, quite frankly, <laughs> I wanted to dethrone um, Sly Dunbar as reggae's top drummer <laughs> by inventing a drum pattern that I thought he'll have to try and work this pattern out. And uh, it was an unusual drum pattern for a reggae song. And when I taught the pattern to a drummer by the name of Drummy Zeb, the 
of him from Aswad. Mm -hmm. And I said, look, you're a drummer. I've got this idea. I want to hear this for four minutes. And he went, wow, magic. Because, you know, when I showed him how, how the pattern was put together with like Calypso hi-hat feel, you know, the um, offbeat snare drum feel of uh, Afrobeat. And then the, the four beats to the floor disco, do, 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 you know, that was 120 BPM that was going on at the time, all the disco things that are still going on at that tempo. And um, I said, right, can you hold that down? And when the bass is playing the slow part, do, 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 I'm, that's the verse of the song. And when it plays the fast part, I go, do, that's the chorus of the song. So we had to um, kind of change the tempo very slightly for the chorus and ease it back in for the verse, right? And we had he had to understand that that the chorus of the song had to had to move up a half a beat in tempo and then sit back uh, for the verse. And uh, at that time, drum machines weren't able to do that. Mm -hmm. So we were creating a new beat. And in fact, my intention was to make lots of songs with that same beat, right? But after the success of uh, Silly Games, I, I didn't dare use that drum <laughs> beat on another song again. What I, what I liked about, forgive me, what I love about what you just said then is it's kind of a, it's a really a British diaspora tune. It's Afrobeat, it's the American influence, it's the West Indian influence, and of course, the British invention. It's pretty coming together spectacular, like pretty spectacular. Yeah, and um, the other thing was that um, Drummy Zeb is of Grenadian roots, and I am of Barbadian roots, and there we were, trying to topple the Jamaican phenomenon. And um, <laughs> in fact, when uh, I told Janet of the high note that it had to be in her, <laughs> and she went, it well. <laughs> you can do that. I must be able to do that, no problem. <laughs> And, uh, and she sat on it like a bird floating, you know, on the air. Yeah. Was 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 she always the choice for for, you know, to to deliver this performance for this track? Was she always the person that you wanted? Well, um, she once said to me, "I wish I never met you." <laughs> Why? <laughs> she said, "Can you imagine what it has to be after I've been doing a concert?" <laughs> Then to have to do that song at the end of the, end concert, of the concert, right? After I've been singing for an hour and hit that note. <laughs> she said, ah, but now I've got a new idea. What she does is she puts the microphone to the, to the audience and goes, and your turn. <laughs> and they, <laughs> what in the audience you know, <laughs> scrambles for the note. And I went, clever girl. <laughs> I think that there's just something absolutely beautiful about how the story's been told. And Dennis, for you being part of it, I know you wanted to be the bus conductor, but to be totally in the heart of this, mm -hmm. this wonderful recreation of your song as well, and the way that Amazing. Steve chose to represent it with this kind of a cappella live rendition within this party, which yeah. just, you, I, I found myself not breathing for the entire time that this was going on because it was so brilliant to watch. What was that like for you, Dennis, to be, to well, see this song have a, another life within this beautiful project? It was melancholic, I, you know, there was times when I was holding back the tears because I think to myself, when I created this thing, I had no idea that it would you know, reached to this stage where um, 40 years later, mm. I'm in a room with uh, budding young black actors and actresses, and uh, they know the song, and they're at least three generations away from the creation of the song, you know, and um, I, I had to um, correct a few of the words for them because um, <laughs> you know, the opening line of the song says I've been wanting you not watching and, uh, everyone's taken to singing 
I've been watching you. <laughs> I'm saying, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> wrong word but largely um, the fact that everyone was waiting for that high note to come and attempt it it was like trying to watch the pole vault at, the pole vault at the olympics you know <laughs> is he going to hit the bar or is he going to scale it and uh unfortunately um having stood in many audiences where i've told janet don't tell them i'm in the audience right because you know <laughs> and she'd be on stage and I'd be sat in the, in, in the mosh pit kind of hearing young girls scream their head off and thinking, yeah, you did it, you didn't, you did, you did, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and having a who did it um, in the dance. Well, I guess with that, that casting of that particular actor for that scene, Steve, in terms of making sure it was someone who could hit that note. Yes. I mean, I think... <laughs> What was interesting for me was how the song transcended uh, and transformed into a real want and a real need into yeah. a situation of, of if it's um, emancipation, spiritual sort of transportation, whatever. It was something which it transcended the, um, you know, sometimes you need the fire um, in order to sort of it, for it to create, into, into, go into something else. And that's yeah. what happened with that song. It was it was very spiritual in, in that room, for sure. Things were happening, which, it, you know, occurred. It just occurred. And he was very happy that uh, we had a camera and we had a, a microphone to record it. You know, I mean, it would have happened if there were no cameras or no microphones. We were just privileged to be there to record it. Yeah. 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 And Steve, I got to say, yet again, thank you for the realization that those words could mean something else to uh, to another situation in life. Um, for instance, it just struck me was we were doing the a cappella there about the games that um, people play with other people, mm -hmm. the silly games and uh, the fact that the people involved there were going, look, we've had enough of those games, you know, and um, it, it gave the song a wider meaning for me and it, and it made me feel, hey, uh, you know, it, it was a, a better creation than I thought in the beginning, and it had a lot more meaning. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the meaning was not, it wasn't a mono meaning that you'd like multiplied the meaning. Ah, oh, Steve McQueen, with the added bonus of Dennis Bavel there, the man who wrote and produced Silly Games, the song that really features predominantly in that film, Lovers Rock of Steve's. Please do go and check it out and the other films in the Small Wax series if you haven't already, because they're very, very powerful and important films as well. A massive thanks to Steve and Dennis for taking the time to chat to me. Again, you can hear their full chat in their episode of Soundtracking. Finally, oh, I love this young woman. She's amazing. Uh, Morvid Clark, brilliant actress. Been thoroughly impressed by watching her journey as an actress. Two films in particular over the last 12 months that I have adored eternal beauty craig roberts film that he wrote and directed and of course saint maud road rose glasses feature length debut um and more of a taken on the the role of maud in this film um i'm just really excited about where she goes and if you haven't seen either of those these films then i definitely go and check them out eternal beauty is this love letter really to craig's uh aunt it's based on her jane um, and it's a, a beautiful and honest and funny and interesting and sad and emotional uh, telling of mental health and someone going through an experience. You very much feel you're, you're seeing it and experiencing it from her perspective. And Morvid plays the younger version of Jane and Sally Hawkins plays the older version. So go and check that out. And the other one, very different, is St. Maud. Um, which quite rightly so is being applauded by pretty much every award ceremony going at the minute. And Morvid in particular has been nominated for an EE Rising Star. But here she is to tell us a little bit more about that extraordinary character that she plays in St. Maud. Dear God, your presence graces the air and soon everyone will see you. Hi, are you Maud? Yes, hi. It takes nothing special to mop up after the dying. You're prettier than the last one. But to save a soul, that's quite something. Bless Amanda's body and bless her mind, which is shrouded in darkness. When you pray, do you get a response? Oh, 
looks like he's physically in me. How did the project present itself to you? What was the journey for you to to get into that first day on on set as Maud? Well, I so I got the script and um, my agent was kind of very excited about it and kind of um, yeah, just basically was like, you need to read this. I think you'd really like it. Um, so I got the script. Yeah. Um, and I went home and was kind of like, I had been told to read this quite seriously, so I have to read it. And kind of, um, I, I remember very, you know, you have these sort of like picture shots in your mind. I remember finishing it and just like, I can see the ceiling really clearly. Cause I just like, even on paper, that ending, you yeah. were like, what? Mm. No. Mm. Um, and so I was, I was also, um, I've been quite obsessed with lots of my family are Catholic and, lots of my family work in the health service. So it was an amalgamation of two oh, things wow. that I'm very interested in, but don't have the skill of writing. And it was just like, someone said lots of my thoughts. Um, um, and then I auditioned for it. And obviously the more you want something, the more terrible you think your auditions have gone. Oh. And so inevitably I was kind of like, damn it, I really like that one. And then um, I did a few auditions with Carmel and then met Rose and kind of, was very just curious about who this person was who had come up with this um and I think we we just kind of got on quite quickly there was lots of kind of unsaid things that I think we understood about each other and then for my final audition it was the scene um in the bed sit where she's writhing about and levitating and vomiting mm -hmm. um and yeah I um I just kind of went in there and um I was not settled, <laughs> gave it all, broke my phone. And then that was, and then the got it. And I was like, Thank yeah. God. And look what's yeah. happening now. Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love Craig Roberts to the oh, end. I know. The and back. Was, was, was that a fun experience doing, you know, Eternal Beauty? And, and what, what do you remember about, about that experience and playing the young Jane? Oh, it was just wonderful. I really feel I'm so, I think Eternal Beauty is so brilliant. And I also think that kind of, if you're gonna watch films about um, mental health, you should watch Eternal Beauty. Like it really made me aware of lots of kind of like stereotypes that I'd harbored and stuff that I didn't realize. It, it's, and it's a film written about someone who Craig loves and adores and you can feel that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, to be part of a film like that and to kind of, but also to really feel that you've, you've become better from being part of it and um, was amazing. And then to work with Sally, just, well, I just cannot believe it. And there was, there was this one day where um, there's a shot of, um, I'm just talking about this in the Q&A actually, there was a shot of the three young sisters and then the three sisters in the present. And that was the only day where we kind of were all together on set. Mm -hmm. And all of us playing kind of the past 80 <laughs> sisters were just kind of looking at Billy Piper, Alice Lowe, Sally Hawkins, just like, I can't believe this is happening. And it was just kind of female splendor. <laughs> and it was, yeah. So it was wonderful. Is that something that's really important to you in terms of, you know, because you, you're working with like Armando and stuff as well and, and the com comedic yeah. side of things as well, which you absolutely nailed, is is making sure that you're able to spin those plates of those different, wants and needs of an actress well I've been incredibly lucky that um I very much haven't really chosen my jobs because you're just kind of like someone wants to employ me oh great <laughs> and um I've luckily very much landed on my feet there and it's been very varied mm. um I think now I'm kind of heading into um a place where I have choice which I'm like ah, that's oh, scary this is what you would yeah it is scary um, definitely, because there's also so, there's just so many paths you could take and stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I feel very lucky that I've been able to do so much different things and mm. kind of on stage as well. Yeah. And I think, um, I think stage was really good for me because like, there's really nowhere to hide. And I think, um, I'm someone who's kind of, um, a short cutter and you just can't do that on stage. And so I think that hopefully has gone into my film work but yeah the gift of choice 
I'm pleased about, but also like uh, the possibility of regret. No. <laughs> I can't wait to see what you choose. So excited. <laughs> um, I know you're in New Zealand and we can't talk about why you're there, but I'm excited about that too. <laughs> and that's all I'm going to say. Um, but um, I just think that, um, you know, I know over the next couple of months and so with regards to St. Maud, um, you know, it's it's already been just, I mean, just, you know, walking along and picking up all these brilliant accolades and recognition. Yeah, and, I believe and it. Quite rightly so. And that's going to continue for the next few months, which is, I think it's wonderful, weirdly kind of, you know, I'm always someone who tries to think about a gra the glass half full and thinking about mm. this pandemic and what we've been through. And the wonderful thing, I think, one of the great things about it is that it's allowed um, British independent film in particular to really have a level pegging in terms of mm. it. They've not been kind of shadowed by these big blockbusters as, mu as yeah. much as they maybe would have been you know in in the in normal circumstances and it is so fantastic to see you know saint maud getting the recognition that it so deserves but also just the being having this journey that's extended now because the awards aren't happening until april and whatnot and so it gives yeah. it even longer life and encourages more people to see it which can only be a great thing i i think as well um yeah what's rose doing next do you know you're gonna to walk together. She's, again. she's, yeah, she's writing something for you. Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> she said it's a rom com, and then someone was like, "With less blood," and she was like, "With some blood." <laughs> so who knows what she's got? <laughs> but yeah, I totally agree with you. The the other day when we were kind of having that rising star like um, Q and A with everyone. Yeah, I was like, oh, like so many of the films that we, us guys were in are like very much small films mm. um yeah and that's just my, my love of film and tv and my need for film and tv has never been stronger than yeah. this year of course and it's kind of yeah to kind of have things like rocks and and his house for example where kind yeah. of as soon as that came out the thirst for new content was so huge that it was so watched it's just amazing yeah, yeah. you were staring slightly is there something wrong with me? No, goodness me, no. I, I apologise for my rudeness. Oh. He's apologising, Jeff. Shall we forgive him? He says we shall. <laughs> Thank you, Chip. Think nothing of it, sir. He speaks very well. It was actually me. <laughs> <laughs> the fabulous... Morvid Clark and she is in the most brilliant collection of nominees for this year's EE e. Rising Star for the BAFTA Awards, the only award voted for by the public uh, and she is joined by B Buki Bakre, um, who stars in Rock's phenomenal Phenomenal young actress and extraordinary film. Um, Conrad Khan, who stars in County Lines. Kingsley Benadir, um, Morvid of course, and uh, Shopee Dirisu as well who stars in the terrifying His House. So there are those are your nominees and it's up to you to go and vote. So you still have time to vote. Um, head to ee.co.uk forward slash BAFTA and the winner will be announced on the 11th of April at the BAFTA Awards, coming to you from the Royal Albert Hall as hosted by yours truly and Mr. Dermot O'Leary. Oh my God. Um, listen, thank you very much for checking out this episode. We've got another couple of episodes coming your way. Uh, but in the meantime, please do go and subscribe to this, but also subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. And in the meantime, stay safe and look after each other and keep supporting film. There's loads of great stuff to check out out there for you already ahead of cinema's opening next month. <laughs>